If you have your Bible with you today, you turn with me to Acts chapter 13, where we left off last week. We're going to begin in verse 13. The title today is The Message, The Story of God's Faithful Grace. We're going to look at the first half of Paul's first sermon recorded in Acts. The whole, the whole story of the Bible is God's glory, glorifying Himself and redeeming creation. That's the story. It's the story of God's kingdom, of God's promises, of God's faithfulness to bring forth His salvation through Jesus, glorifying Himself. Throughout the whole Scripture, we see God's Word is faithful. There's no doubt. God's Word is faithful even through the sufferings and the wickedness of this fallen world. This week the world saw a terrible tragedy, a wickedness perpetrated by an evil man. His children were, were murdered in a school. I mean, it's, it's hard to have hope through something like that. You know, in fact, we could, we could go through a whole list, really, of... of the wickedness and the evils that are happening today, uh, not just something like this, which is just a clear-cut example of just demonic wickedness, but all the things in society, the trajectory of our society. We could go through a list of all the things that are going on. But also, we could go through this very room among individuals and families that are sitting in this room today And we could talk about the trials that you're going through, the sufferings that you're enduring at at this moment. I'm not talking about something 20 years ago. I'm talking about people that I know of in our own congregation going through sufferings, going through trials, going through attacks, going through all these issues happening right now. With all of this going on in the world and even closer to home in our own lives, man, it's hard to see the hand of God in the trajectory of how things are going in the evil and the sufferings of this life. So, what I want to say first, church, is that the world won't always be like this. A Savior has come to reconcile all of creation. And a King is coming again. And He's going to bring justice where there doesn't seem to be any justice right now. And He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. And He's going to bring a new heavens and a new earth where indwells righteousness and there is no more sin, there is no more unrighteousness. And right now in this fallen world, the creation itself, the Bible tells us, is groaning for it. A Messiah has come and He's provided Himself as the way for humanity to come and enter into that new life that will be eternal, to have eternal life in that new creation. That is the message of the Bible. That's the grand epic. That's the big story of creation, the purpose of it all. It's also the big story of Scripture. And this is the message that the world needs to hear in the midst of all of this that's going on. This is the message that broken people need to hear in the midst of their trials and their sufferings. This is the message that sinners need to hear. This is the reason for mission. God's kingdom will go to all the earth. As we've been working through Acts... We've seen the gospel message flourish. We've seen it flourish in the early church. And last week, as we began chapter 13, we saw Paul and Barnabas commissioned and sent out as missionaries from Antioch in Syria. They covered the entire island of Cyprus from one end to the other, even converting the Roman proconsul that was there in Cyprus. And today, as we continue in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are going to travel inland into Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And what we have is Paul's first recorded sermon in Acts in a synagogue there. Now, that sermon that he preaches is 
We're going to take two weeks to focus on it, so we're going to break it into two parts. Look at the first part today and the second part next week. But before we examine that sermon, let's look at where the sermon is preached as we see the setting of it in the first part of our text today. In verse 13 it says, this is right after uh, Cyprus and the proconsul is converted and they've gone through the whole island of Cyprus. It says, now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, which is the city that, on, the, on the west side of Cyprus, and came to Perga in Pamphylia. That's a coastal city right there at the south end of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And John, this is John Mark, left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. They were heading north up into Turkey. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, they leave Cyprus and they travel north into what's modern day Turkey. They land at Perga, which is a coastal city there, and they head north into the region of Pisidia, and they enter another city called Antioch. This is not the same one they left. That was in Syria. This is in Pisidia in in Turkey, uh, in Asia Minor. And here, John Mark decides, before they head that way, John Mark decides he's leaving them and going back to Jerusalem. We're not told why he leaves, but this is going to be, uh, it's going to be a source of contention later between Paul and Barnabas. So just log that in your memory, and we'll come back to it when the text does. So they arrive in the city, they follow their mission practice that we saw last week of going to the synagogue first, and as they are there on the Sabbath day, after in the service, after the readings of the law and the prophets, they're invited to speak a word of encouragement. It's not uncommon for a visiting rabbi to be invited to speak. But the sermon they got from Paul is certainly not the one they expected to get. And so today we're going to look at the first half of it. And in the first part of his sermon, Paul shows that God's faithful grace has always been given to his people throughout history. He's going to trace the history of Israel and God's work in his people and his faithfulness to his promises and his grace. And then in the second half, in his conclusion, he's going to show how those promises are all fulfilled in Jesus Christ, God's grace to his people. Now, in this deal, as we're going to start picking up reading at, the, uh, uh, at verse 16, you need to understand that Paul's going to move very quickly through the history of Israel because the people in the synagogue, they knew all the details of everything that he references as he walks down through the history of God's work. They heard it every Old Testament, every Sabbath they heard the Old Testament preached, the Hebrew Scriptures preached, so they knew all about this. But we are going to explain everything as we go So you can understand Paul's point. God has been faithful to His Word. And God has brought fulfillment of His Word and His promise in Jesus Christ. And that means for us today that God is still faithful to His Word. So as we look at this, Paul begins, Men and brothers, listen to what I'm about to say. And then he starts by telling them about God's faithfulness. Verse 16 says, So Paul stood up, And motioning with his hand, I always wondered what that motion is. He does it three or four times in Acts. He said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. He says, God chose the fathers of Israel. He's talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of those uh, uh, those fathers of Israel in Genesis. In Genesis, God called Abraham forth to be the father of his nation for really no reason at all. It was simply just an act of grace. Abraham didn't deserve anything, but God called him out of his idolatry God called him from the land of Mesopotamia and God called him to leave his father's house and he said, go to a land, you don't even know where it is. I'll show you where it's at. You just go where I tell you. And God gave Abraham a promise. He said, you'd be the father of a great nation and then later, you'll be the father of many nations. From the beginning of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, God has commanded mankind to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. His purpose in all of creation is that that those that are made in His image would spread that image to the entirety of the creation. 
But in Genesis chapter 3, we see that man has continually sinned and failed to do what God has commanded him to do. Now through Abraham, as God calls him, God himself would do what he commanded. He doesn't tell Abraham to be fruitful and multiply. He gives Abraham a promise. I will do this. I will bring forth a great nation from you. I will multiply my image through you. And it was through Abraham that God promised that the gospel would come forth to the Gentile world as well. Paul tells us that in Galatians chapter 3. He says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith, meaning faith in Jesus Christ, are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Moving quickly through the timeline, Paul moves past the calling of the fathers of Israel to the captivity in Egypt. In verse 17, it says, He chose our fathers, and he says, And made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. Such a simple little statement like that. We might read right past it, but there's so much behind it. Right now, on Wednesday nights, we're going through Exodus. And so if you've been part of that study with us, you realize too the fact that he made them numerous, that he grew them in Egypt was a fulfillment of promise. God promised to make Israel a great nation, a mighty nation, but as they entered into Egypt, there was only 70 members of the family. There was only 70 people that entered into there, but in Egypt, God grew them just as he promised to do. And when a new Pharaoh came to power... They had multiplied so much that he tried to stop it. First, he enslaved them. It says he put taskmasters over them. Then he tried to convince the midwives, Pharaoh did, to kill all of the infants, the male babies that were being born, so that they would stop the growth. And then when those midwives defied his command, he just made it a national policy. We're going to kill all the male children of the Israelites. We're going to throw them into the Nile. But despite all of Pharaoh's efforts to stop the growth of His people. God was faithful to His Word and they continued to grow. Became a mighty nation. And at the end of verse 17, it says, And He made them great during their stay in Egypt and with an uplifted arm He led them out of it. God delivered them out of Egypt through Moses and the the ten plagues and the, the story of Exodus. God brought them deliverance. He brought them salvation. And it wasn't because of their goodness. It wasn't because of their faithfulness. They were anything but faithful. It was because of His grace, because of His promise, because of His word to Abraham. God was faithful to bring deliverance to His people. And then Paul fast-forwards again. He said, and about 40 years He put up with them in the wilderness. Boy, a truer statement has never been uttered. Through the wilderness wanderings, The people continually complained, they grumbled, they refused to trust God, even at one point saying, we were better off in Egypt in slavery than we are now. But yet by grace He led them with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. By grace He fed them with manna from heaven. By grace He fed them with quail in the desert. By grace He gave them water to drink and caused their clothes and their their shoes not to wear out. He nurtured them in the wilderness because He was faithful to His Word, faithful to His promise, even when His people weren't faithful to Him. Then Paul moves to Israel under Joshua. It says, verse 19, And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, Paul says in front of this synagogue, He gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. In the book of Joshua, you see God's hand in defeating the nations of the land, of Canaan. He gave the people victory after victory after victory, and He gave them the land that He promised to give Abraham and his descendants. Centuries earlier, He promised that He would give Abraham the land as an inheritance, and centuries later, He fulfilled that promise. Despite their failure, despite their faithlessness, despite their sins. There were many times in Joshua as they were taking the land that the people sinned and they had to be disciplined. But God disciplined them and continued to give them victory over the land. 
God's grace and faithfulness is on full display from Abraham to the promised land. That's what Paul wants these synagogue hearers to see. He is the main character of the story. If you look back through verses 16 through 20, God is the subject. God is doing all the action. God is the hero of the story. And the story doesn't stop there. God is also faithful from Judges to David. Paul continues, And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Here's another statement that's just packed with meaning. Paul's audience in the synagogue, steeped in the Hebrew Scriptures, would understand the depths of what happened during the time of the judges. The time of the judges was a time of explicit sin and faithlessness in Israel. The theme of the book of Judges, when you read it, is everybody just does what's right in their own eyes. And if you read through the book of Judges, man, it's horrible. There are some horrible things in that book. But in that book, there's a cycle that repeats over and over again. The people sin. They turn away from their God. They worship idols. And then God turns them over to an oppressor or another nation that conquers them. And then in their suffering, under the oppression of that nation, they cry out to God for salvation, and God raises up a judge, a deliverer, to save them. And after they're saved, after they're delivered from their oppression, you know what they do? They go right back into their sin and turn away from God. And that cycle happens over and over and over and over again in the book of Judges. So when Paul says God gave them judges, he's saying God was continually faithful to His people through this time, raising up deliverers for His people over and over and over again, even though God knew that they would be stubborn, rebellious, and faithless once they were delivered. But even in the face of that rebellion, even in the face of that stubbornness, God was faithful to His Word. And then all of the people's sinfulness comes to a head under Samuel the prophet when the people ask God for a king. It said in verse 21, Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. Now God had always purposed to give Israel a king. Moses said so in Deuteronomy 17. But when they asked for a king, it was not because they were seeking God's will. They were doing so because they wanted to be like the other nations. They explicitly say this. And when they came to Samuel and they asked for a king, Samuel hated the idea. And he goes and he prays to the Lord and says, Lord, why are these people like this? Why are they doing this? We can't do this. You are king over us. And when he prays to the Lord in 1 Samuel, 1, 1 Samuel 8, chapter 7, chapter 8, verse 7, I'm going to slow down. He prays to the Lord and the Lord answers Samuel about them wanting a king. And he says this, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, meaning ordain for them a king just like they asked. For they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. This was an act of rebellion. But God gave them the king that they wanted. They wanted Saul. And boy, did that not turn out well for them. King Saul started out okay, but he quickly became wicked and an unjust tyrant. And even though... That is exactly what the people asked for, what they wanted. God did not abandon His people in their sin. Paul continues on, he says, And when He had removed him, when God removed Saul, God didn't abandon His people. He removed Saul and He gave them His king. When He had removed Saul, He raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Remember, this is Paul speaking in a synagogue. King David was used to to bring glory and grace to Israel because he was such a perfect person. No? Yes? No? Stay with me. Not even close. No, no, David's sin is widely known. And described in the scripture. But yet he was a man after God's heart. 
And he was used to bring glory and grace to Israel despite his sin, despite his failure. God used him mightily and promised that one day God would raise up a son of David. And God would give that son of David the kingdom forever. And he would sit upon David's throne forever. The mention of King David in in Paul's sermon before the synagogue would have brought all of this to mind. And that's what Paul is counting on. Up to this point, Paul has basically just run through the history of Israel and God's faithfulness to Israel. And the people in the synagogue, they would have been sitting there going, Yeah, that's right. Amen. Yeah, brother. Well, maybe they wouldn't have said that. They probably ain't from the South. But they would have been saying, That's right. Amen. Blessed is David. Blessed is the God of David. They would have been nodding along in agreement. That's right. God has been faithful to His people. These things that Paul was saying were said every Sabbath day as they studied the Hebrew Scriptures. It would have been something they'd heard over and over and over again as Paul's recounting God's work in the history of Israel. And what they expected was the next statement that always comes is, and one day, synagogue... God will bring the son of David and he will deliver God's people, Israel. He will bring forth his kingdom. But that's not what Paul says. Instead, Paul says, and he's already done it. He says that God's faithful grace is fulfilled in Jesus. Verse 23, of this man's offspring, of David's offspring, God, not will, but has brought to Israel a Savior. Jesus, as He promised. He promised David to bring the Son of David. The promised Savior, the Son of David, is Jesus Christ. And God has fulfilled His promise. That's Paul's message to this synagogue. The kingdom of God has come, and the kingdom of God is coming in its fullness. That would have shocked everybody in the synagogue. What did he just say? So you're saying that the Messiah, the one to whom God promised the kingdoms, His kingdom, to sit on the throne of David forever, you're saying that He's already come. The one who's going to sit on David's throne. The one who's going to bring glory and redemption. He's already come. That's exactly what Paul is saying. That's the whole point of the Scriptures. It all points to Jesus Christ. The promises of David have been fulfilled. The promises to Abraham have been fulfilled. That's the whole point of that long genealogy at the beginning of the first book of the New Testament. You know in Matthew, the one you always skip when you're reading it? Matthew 1.1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it gives the genealogy. This is the one that that all of the Hebrew Scriptures point to. He has come and He has delivered His people. The promises to David have been fulfilled in Him. The promises to Abraham have been fulfilled in Him. He is the one that we are looking for, Paul would say, to the synagogue. And God has done it. And not only has He done it, but He didn't do it in secret. He sent a prophet to prepare his people for the coming of the Messiah. In verse 24 and 25, Paul continues, Before his coming, before Jesus' coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. He told you, God gave you an announcement that he has come and that his son is coming. God was faithful to announce His coming. John the Baptist was a prophet in the same vein as Elijah, preparing the way for the Lord. At the beginning of John's ministry, it says in verse 24 that he preached a baptism of repentance. God sent him to prepare the hearts of the people for Jesus. He was preparing them by calling them to see their need, to see their sin, and to repent of that sin. They needed to be confronted with their sin. They needed to understand just being a descendant of Israel was not good enough. Just being part of this lineage is not good enough. Just being religious or a good person is not good enough. That can't make you right with God. They needed to see that a Savior is coming and you need Him. The same is true for people today. Sin is serious to God. And we must see it as so. Regardless of our goodness, or our religious works, the law is perfect, and we must keep it perfectly. 
And this realization that we can't do so is what drives us to a Savior. I cannot do it, therefore I must have someone do it for me. And Jesus is the only candidate that has stepped forward and said, I will. The beginning of John's ministry, he prepared them by preaching repentance. And at the end of John's ministry, he pointed away from himself to it. It says, and as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, that the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. The end of John's ministry, he was saying, I, I'm done, but I'm not him. He's coming. One greater than me is coming. And he is the answer. He is salvation. He is the deliverer. He is the Messiah. Look to him to find salvation. Don't look to me. Look to him. That is the message of the first part of Paul's sermon. He basically runs through the history of Israel with a synagogue full of people who would have been in agreement with him. And he tells them, it has been fulfilled. It is finished. The first half of Paul's sermon shows Jesus' fulfillment of all God's promises to His people, to David, to Abraham. And it shows us that in all history, God was preparing His people and creation for this Savior who was coming. And that Savior is none other than Jesus Christ. In the second part of his sermon that we'll look at next week, he shows how the death and resurrection of Jesus has fulfilled these promises. But if you look at Paul's journey in this sermon up to this point, you see really a striking contrast between God's actions and Israel's actions. God has been faithful to His Word, faithful to His promises. God has given grace after grace after grace after grace to His people. Grace was given to Abraham when he was called out for no reason other than God's will. Grace was given to Israel as he multiplied them under all of Pharaoh's attacks and then saved them out of Egypt even when they were faithless. Grace was given to them when he took care of them in the wilderness even though they were rebellious and and faithless and sinful. God kept his promise through all of history. God faithfully has given more grace, more grace, More grace. He gave them grace during the period of the judges as He delivered them over and over and over again knowing that each time He delivered them they were going to run right back into idolatry. Turn from God over and over again. Even when the people flat out rejected God as their king and demanded a king so they could be like the nations, God gave them grace and removed that evil king that they wanted so bad and gave them a king after his own heart. And now Paul would say, God has once again brought forth His grace and faithfulness. And He's brought forth His grace to an ultimate and final fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The Father has sent God the Son from all eternity, taking upon Himself the nature of a man to give Himself as a sacrifice for sin so that the sin that so characterizes us and this fallen world can be atoned, can be paid for so that the sinner can be accepted before a holy God. The justice of a holy God can be satisfied once and for all. Paul is announcing to this synagogue that the glorious day of God's perfect salvation has finally come. God has given more grace. Today, church, God has given us grace in the gospel. God has given us His Son so that the chasm separating you from God can be bridged. The last verse we'll read is kind of the midpoint in Paul's sermon. After all of this, explaining Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promise, he says, Brethren, Sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. To us, Mulvane, this message has been sent. There's a lot of hurt going on in the world today. There's a lot of hurt going on in families in our own community today. 
There's a lot of wickedness in our world today. Fallenness. Unimaginable evil in our world today. Our world is fallen. And it's sinful. But it will not always be this way. God is faithful to His Word. That is the point of Paul's sermon up to this point in the synagogue. God is faithful to His Word and God has told us there is coming a day when all of this will be made right. And it's not just His It's not just us looking into the future and saying, well, one day it's going to be. It is that, of course. But understand, God has already accomplished it. It's sure and certain that our creation will be redeemed. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. It's sure and certain that all the tears will be wiped away from every eye. It's sure and certain that justice will flow down like water Because Jesus Christ has accomplished it already on the cross. Jesus has perfected the salvation of His people. And He has purchased this eternal life that we so look forward to in the perfect sense one day. We have it now, but we look forward to it when there's no more sin. When there's a new heavens and a new earth. Church, this message is for us today. To us has been sent the message of this salvation. This message is for us today. But to be part, to be a receiver of this salvation, you must be found in Him. This message that Paul gives this synagogue, it's the heart of missions. It's the heart of Christianity. It is the only hope for sinners. It's the only hope for a lost and broken world. It's the only hope for the wickedness that we see everywhere in society and in individuals. It is the only hope. Jesus Christ, crucified, raised from the dead, enthroned in glory, and one day coming back to make this world perfect. To us He has sent this message. The only question today is what will you do with the message? The message has come forth and it has been given. Jesus Christ has given Himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And He calls all men, as Paul will later say in Acts, all men everywhere to repent. Trust in Jesus today. And eternal life will be yours at this very moment. And as the people of God We can look across a lost and dying world and first we can give them the only message of hope that there is. And secondly, we can say, Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. And God, we ask that you would prepare our hearts as we continue to continue to walk with you in this world. Lord, we, we look at your word, God, and we hold fast to your promises knowing that you have ever been faithful and will ever be faithful. The stars themselves will burn out and the heavens will roll up like a scroll, but your word will endure forever. God, help us to trust. Help us to wrap all of our hope in you, for you are the only hope. And God, help us to be a people, as Paul and Barnabas were, that were going with this message to tell of this hope for those who have none. And God, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that you would call upon their hearts today. Let them know that you are a God who is faithful. You are a God who is compassionate. You are a God who keeps His word, and that word has been given in Jesus Christ. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you'll find rest for your soul. Father, that is the word that we need to hear today. God, help us. Help us to call upon your name. And God, we pray that you would save souls in our midst today. In Jesus' name, amen.
As always, I'm going to stand right down here, down front. I would love to speak with you. I would love for you to come and trust in Jesus to, to let me pray for you, whatever it is that you need. There's also some people that are going to be standing right back by, in front of the library, and they want to pray with you. They want to answer any questions you may have about the church or, or what your next step with God would be. You do business with God today. Will you stand with me?